Okay, so now we have uh, Sebastian Roca Ayarat from the well, Instituto de Ciencia y <laughs> Otra de Aragón. And now we ha uh, is going to talk about quantum machine learning with qubits. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for being all here. So I'm going to try to be fast so we can go everyone to lunch. So luckily for me, we have already had a series of very nice talks about the topics that I'm going to cover here. So uh, first of all, I want to introduce to you why we work with uh, single qubits. And this is uh, because our group has a significant experience in this uh, area and is one of the main uh, lines of research. Um, more specifically, we study the use of molecular nanomagnets as natural platforms to try to implement systems with more than two levels. Um, we study also in, in how we can control these qubits, these molecular nanomagnets, with superconducting uh, resonators, about, about which uh, Alicia will talk, about, will talk more after lunch. And essentially, we couple these molecules uh, via Siemen coupling to the electromagnetic uh, to the magnetic uh, field generated by the electromagnetic uh, fields. So uh, the main motivation here, the, the main goal, is to deal with super supervised learning tasks. Usually, one resorts to the, let's call it, digital paradigm, where a bunch of Python libraries like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras are used, and different models like neural network uh, uh, models, random forest, SGBoost, and, and so on. But we ask ourselves, like in a similar fashion as, as Christian told us now, what happens if we include a physical system in the, in the process? So in, in a, let's say, digital analog perspective, right? So the most, Epa. The most simple uh, physical system or the most simple quantum system we can think of is a two-level system, a qubit, uh, for which Alba explained before that it suffices in the sense that a single qubit is a universal classifier and a universal approximate. So we ask ourselves if uh, adding more levels poses any advantage or does something. And also we want or we try to uh, to answer what is the model really learning or what does it mean to learn in this in this case so for this we are going to use three main tools variational algorithms an encoding strategy and and metric learning so uh, I think I will talk like this but, uh, so the, the first tool is going to be a variational algorithm. I am not going to explain again what this is. So um, what I'm going to explain is which type of answers are we going to use. So following Alva's advice, we go to the lab and we ask our experimental colleagues, hey, what is the most simple operation you can perform in the lab? And they think and say, well, uh, a monochromatic radio frequency pulse. And we say, OK. So we are going to use this as uh, our answers. We can go to the interaction picture of the system, and we can get a, math a mathematical expression for this kind of operation. So this fixes, in turn, the encoding we can use. So our encoding is going to be the experimental parameters that are going then to be implemented in the lab. So uh, in general, we are trying to encode uh, classical data, classical points from the real space into the Hilbert space of our qubit. So for this, we use a classical transformation, a classical function that transforms our original data into new rescaled data with some parameters that are going to be optimized then, like in the usual neural network approach. And this, in turn, will fix uh, through the answers, the kind of unitary operations that we can perform, and therefore the wave functions that we are going to generate for each uh, classical data point. So now uh, talking more about what are we going to learn, we are going to work in the metric learning uh, framework, which is one of the most powerful approaches in, in supervised learning. So we want to map our data to a feature space that is going to be the Hilbert space of our QDIT, right? 
So we want that points that belong to the same class are close to each other, whereas they are far as far as possible from points from other classes. Um, so we are learning, or the model is learning some metric that is able to cluster points together if they are in the same class and far away from all the other class. But this is what we do in quantum mechanics with this approach. Our data points, our classical data points, are mapped into the Hilbert space of our Qubit. So the feature space is the, the Hilbert space itself. Um, so we want to map our points to some quantum state that is close to a reference state, let's say. So for each class, we are going to have a reference state that we want to be maximally orthogonal to the other reference states. And in the literature, they, dis they discuss uh, two methods, uh, implicit and explicit. In the explicit, you fix the reference states. And in the explicit one, you no? yes, I think this is wrong. Well, you have two ways uh, to proceed. <laughs> uh, you either fix these reference states, you know how to compute them, and you say, these are my reference states, or you let uh, these reference states as free parameters to be found by the, by the algorithm. Um, what happens, uh, nonetheless, when you have more classes than levels available? So if you have the same number of levels as, uh, as classes, your reference states could be the, the states from the orthonormal basis, for example. But if you have more classes than, than levels available, you need to find the set of maximally orthogonal states, which is not a trivial task at all. And for this, we use a genetic algorithm in a similar way or a similar algorithm that Pablo explained before. And just I'm going to show you now the, the results that we got with all this procedure. And we start with the most basic and most simple uh, data set, which is the Iris data set, which contains four features and three classes. Okay? So if we compute the, uh, a distribution of accuracies that we get with both methods, both implicit and explicit, for different QD dimensions, we see that the uh, system is able to find better solutions by itself. What does it mean? That sometimes uh, the system is able to predict better the classes if we don't fix the reference states. And also we see that the test accuracy saturates a dimension equal to three, which is the number of classes we have uh, for this problem, right? So the QD dimension doesn't play a significant uh, role here. And we see also that both methods perform well. So, okay, everything seems to work. Uh, to compare why both methods uh, perform so similarly, we can plot the, the distribution of points that uh, the model does after training, and we can see in the explicit one, we fix the reference states, the maximally orthogonal states, and we see that the points cluster more or less uh, around them. But in the implicit one, where the system needs to find by itself the reference states, it also does, does it very well because the, the system, uh, sorry, the data set is, is small enough. So we, if we go to a more complicated data set like the Breast Cancer Wisconsin, which contains more features, but is a binary problem, we see that again, the QD dimension doesn't play a crucial role and both methods uh, perform similarly. So we compare these results that we got with the best uh, classical models and we see that, well, okay, it, it works. Um, and we get uh, accuracies that are in the same order of magnitude, let's see. So uh, to check the impact of the QD dimension, we have to go to data sets that are much more complicated or that the dimension of the classical data points is much higher than the number of levels we have available. So for this, we go to the paradigmatic uh, image classification of the digits. And uh, for this, we propose a hybrid model in which following the, the spirit of variational algorithms or hybrid classical quantum algorithms, we use a classical convolutional network as a dim dimension reducer. Then this uh, will uh, 
reduce the number of parameters that are going to be fed into the quantum processor, and then we update everything together by a, a classical optimizer. So uh, to make it fair, we are going to compare how does it perform the, the exact same convolutional network when we add a qubit or not. So uh, just I will go briefly on this, and if you have more questions, we can you, you can ask me later or, or whatever. But the main conclusion that we get here is that by adding more levels to the system and adding more layers to the ANSAT, we increase the nonlinearity of the model and we increase the expressibility of uh, our model, and we are able to to surpass the the classical model. I am not claiming anything about uh, <laughs> quantum supremacy because I will go back. Uh, when I say that it surpasses the classical model, I say that the quantum unit adds something to the compound system, let's say, and it doesn't act as a bottleneck or worsens the, the result. So uh, with this, uh, I will just say that we see that for certain kind of problems, in increasing the number of levels offers advantages in terms of uh, information management and processing. We have developed tools to deal with any kind of data set. Uh, that is number of uh, levels and data dimension in supervised learning tasks with a single unit of information. And that these tools are however efficient because remember that our ANSAT is directly the simplest operation that one can perform in, a, in, in the lab. And moreover, we can extract a geometrical interpretation of what does, it, what does it mean to learn in this case to cluster points around the Hilbert space uh, as far as, as can be possible from the other classes. And with all this, just to thank my advisors, David and Fernando and Juan, who also collaborated in this work, and you for your kind attention. So thank you very much. So, yeah. Um, we will try with this one. So a short question, that wants to have lunch. Just to be sure, you mentioned genetic algorithms. Do you also use them in the convolutional, in the last example, in the convolutional we hybrid use them, one? Uh, we use the genetic algorithm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we use the genetic algorithm just to uh, to and obtain and the why? maximally orthogonal state. So in the in the digits uh, case, we are dealing with ten classes because we have ten digits. So to obtain uh, ten maximally orthogonal states, uh, it is not trivial at all. In because in the qubit you have the, the block sphere representation, so you can more or less see how this uh, maximally orthogonal states looks like. But for a Q3, two quart, or uh, whatever, you don't have any 3D geometrical interpretation. So that's why we we go for a genetic algorithm to extract this maximally orthogonal state. <laughs> okay. Are there more questions? Thank you, thank you for this this nice talk. And I was wondering if, because at the end of the day, this is classical data, that's with quantum. But have you wonder what could be examples of things that you could do to extend these ideas to process, process quantum data with the? Yes, it could be interesting. And something I I thought uh, some time ago was. If the, for example, there are some data sets that contain a uh, time series. So for example, the data set consists of how something evolves in time. And maybe it could be interesting to see if the, the quantum evolution, uh, so how to include uh, the unitary evolution of a quantum system in, if in that kind of problems, you know, but. So let's thank Sebastian again.